Hi, I'm Matt Dean of the CEO of Screen Produce Australia, and I'm delighted to be uh, introducing our new spa takeaways, our relaunch of these series. We're doing these conversations um, sporadically, but designed to give people insights uh, from a, a leader within our industry so that we can better inform and, and talk about what's the challenges we're facing um, and the landscape as it's evolving very rapidly. Um, I would acknowledge that I'm coming from Gadigal lands and um, give honour and celebration to the Indigenous people of this area, um, the leadership they've offered in the community of arts and cultural pursuits. Particularly in our screen industry as well, we have many incredible Indigenous practitioners um, and I'm really delighted that also we're being hosted by Tribal Apes, who've been a great partner to us um, for many years in different forms. But my delight is uh, ever effervescent because we have Kim Williams with us, and I'm really, really thrilled that you're our first guest, Kim. Um, uh, you've been a leader in our industry for many years. Uh, you've um, been involved in the studios. You've been a, a leader of a production company. You've also led a broadcaster in Foxtel. Um, you've also been part of the funding system in the AFC and the FFC, and you're now chair of the ABC. So welcome to this conversation. Thank you very much for joining me. It's a real pleasure to be here, Matt. I want to start with talking about how much has changed in our sector since we, probably the, you and I spoke maybe 11 or so years ago when you did the Hector Crawford lecture at Screen Forever. I back remember in that well. 2013. I burst into tears. Yeah, it was, a, it was an emotion. I, fe I felt the emotion of it um, and I think the audience did, but um, you might want to describe that because it, it, you were overcome, I think, in, the, in the, the moment around the importance of the conversation perhaps and your relationship with Hector and uh, many of those relationships are very coarse. It, maybe, uh, maybe touch well, on that. I, but I also, wonder whether yeah. that's still persists. I hope it does. Mm. But um, mentoring is very important in my view. And I think we under mentor people in Australia mm. and people don't seek out mentors as much as they did when they were of my age. Mm. But Hector was a really lovely man to me. And he was a mentor you'd describe. He, oh, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, no question. And, and Hector, Hector saw me as a bit of a lucky charm. Okay. So that when I was running the, the Australian Film Commission and Hector was going to do an, a, a pitch somewhere, he'd, um, he'd ring up and he'd say, um, are you free for a cup of tea this morning? Yeah. And I'd say, sure. And he'd come in and I'd say, what are you pitching? And he said, well, look, I haven't quite worked out the pitch. <laughs> right. Because he'd sort of make it up <laughs> on, the, on, on the run. And he said, but you're my lucky charm, yeah. so... Do you find... Um, I really loved him. We, we had a very common interest in music. OK, And, and yes. Hector, of course, back when I was a kid, mm. had a program called Showcase where he had a big orchestra and he would conduct mm. the orchestra. And he, he was a good musician and he had a t prodigious knowledge of music. We don't often talk about the intersection with music and screen. Yeah. It's very, very vibrant and connected. Um, I... I uh, with someone like um, Hector, who was a, a sort of a pillar of the industry, I do wonder about those pillars that we're building going forward. And maybe it's a segue into talking about what's changed at that point um, when we were talking. Because the, the Convergence Review had just come out. There'd been some recommendations, some of which I think you were viscerally unhappy about, maybe the Finkelstein part. But there were also recommendations um, to do with effectively streaming at that even though that that hadn't fully launched itself um and in the between there's been such tectonic sort of shifts between some of these bigger businesses technology ai um some of the global giants have gobbled each other up but all of these things have gone on so do you want to just you know walk us into where we are now from that period in your view and it's well a huge we have we have lived into a a complete fragmentation of all that we have known and a, a huge realignment of the power constructs within the world of, of entertainment and information mm -hmm. delivery across the whole spectrum. So that the players who were mighty and in many ways unassailable 15 or 20 years ago are in many instances not even with us any longer. Yes. And that, that is a fascinating phenomenon. In fact, one of the things that I find most most compelling in, in, in an observational sense about digital technologies is they're utterly destructive of existing models mm. and create new models, but the new models usually are very, very unpredictable. <laughs> I, I'm 
what it sets up is the, con- you know, the, the the impact of technology into art as well and creativity. And I guess I'm posing that sort of question, is it a force for good or is it a force for not so much good? Um, well, uh, Matt, I've always had a, a, an analogy to binary thinking, you, you know, and, and in Australia we often have this this or that, yeah. not this and that and that mm-hmm. and this too. And, you know, I'm a much more pluralist kind of thinker mm-hmm. and I have, I have difficulty in, in this kind of black and white view of, of the world that, that so often populates the way in which we go about things and the way in which we think about things because I think the world's not like that. I think the world, we've moved into a very fuzzy landscape yes. and whilst that might make people feel insecure and whilst it might make for, for deep anxiety in terms of where am I going, how am I getting there, that's the nature of the world we live in now. Mm. Which sets up the idea that something like AI can be many things. And many things. Uh, I mean, I, I can see many remarkably magnificent things in AI, and I'm seeing it in journalism where AI... I, I've chaired Reuters for the, for, the, mm. for the last eight years, and, and I've been on the board for nine years, and I have one year left, and... I've seen the way in which AI is being introduced to the newsroom Mm. at Reuters and it has liberated an enormous Mm. amount of time in order to enable journalism to actually do the tough stuff while all the process work is now done by machines. And the way in which the machines operate is truly awesome that you can say, summarise that in six points Mm. for me Mm. and it will go... Give me three different headlines that I can choose from and it'll go... Mm. And for process work, that is absolutely terrifically useful because it liberates so much time for people to get on and doing serious interrogative stuff Mm. and serious analytical stuff um, and serious... Mm interviewing stuff yeah and um, and, and, and that uh, that just seems to me to be a very natural kind of application of another new technology yes. now when we get into imagery and and you know Reuters were the ones who first called out the fake imagery of the royal photo mm. um, when when Kate came yes. out of her um, her, 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 her cancer incident yes. and, and real that real the um, yeah. revealed the family photo and Someone in the Reuters pick department said, mm, "That's that's not right. That that you can't actually make a photo, and the light's not right there." And and it was a it, it had been photoshopped by the family, and you know, understandably, I mean, it's hardly yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. a, an offence we all commit every day, sort of thing. <laughs> but they'd published it as a real photo, yes. and so they had, they called it out, and they pub, you know, it was mm. became a huge story, of course. Well, it seems that if we translate that into where uh, the AI conversation is at the moment, it seems to be mostly about um, being um, transparent with people about the use of technology in certain ways, and also the remuneration elements associated with original work and how you might mm. flow that through to the creative, you know, brains or trust that's behind that work um, but you know that's a, a long conversation to have they're immensely going. important issues <coughs> and they're ones that must be resolved um, and as in all things I mean it, it requires goodwill and serious discussion um, the Australian marketplace for media <coughs> production I, I think has never been more impacted by global forces um, businesses that were once there was a lock around um, buying a, a commercial media enterprise that's since passed um, the aggregation of media um, you've got a, a very large influence from what are probably more US based businesses into the market um, what do you think the consequences for the broader industry are of all of this? Um, if you were running a, a broadcaster or, or were back in the day at Foxtel, you know, which is for sale uh, ostensibly you know, in, in the press, what, what, would, what would you be doing? How would you be operating in this landscape from that platform level in this I, environment? I, 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 I would be and am saying never before has Australian content mattered more. Yeah. Um, we have both the advantage and the extreme disability of speaking English. Mm. And that means 
that we have many opportunities available to us, but we have none of the natural protections that being from a different cultural framework, which is partially described by the language you speak, the protections that attach to that. Mm. You know, there are certain natural protections if you are a, in Germany yes. or if you're in Italy or Spain and, you know, insert country here that doesn't mm. speak English. And there are certain natural storytelling constructs that flow from that and certain natural entertainment constructs that flow from that that are cultural characteristics of the language you speak and all that flows from that language. In English, it means that we are plunder and mm. we are freely available for, to not put too fine a point on it, invasion. <laughs> <laughs> and there, 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 there is, to use another metaphor, a kind of digital tsunami mm. that is consuming the hearts, minds and aspirations of our citizens broadly and most particularly the next generation of Australians. Mm. And th their, their aspirations are now often being described by producers and creators who don't think about Australia at all. Mm. And yet there are many very precious things that we need to ensure are, are protected and nourished from Australian roots that represent genuinely different values and genuinely different historical perceptions and, 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 and in fact, historical contributors to the pathway that Australians have adopted mm. and that have contributed to Australian personality makeups. And And I think you were getting to the rub of the moment, right? Um, and how the question is, how does how does a government act in that space? Because um, business is going to do its thing. It's going to be always seeking um, profit for profit's sake. And it's the role of business. Um, it's got responsibilities to shareholders. And digital platforms have no, no boundaries. There's no ways to, unless you start to be very active in this environment. And uh, it's, it's fascinating what you just, of course, described because part of the changes in, to Indigenous culture was removal of language and that really affected it. But in Europe, we've managed a process of regulating um, different parts of the system System, maybe not in perfectly in different ways, but that ranges from a lot of digital areas. They haven't had to define, and they the language as part of. Sorry, they have defined language as part of that. They haven't had to define French culture. They've just said French language um, in terms of outputs. And I think uh, I'll bring us forward into today and what your th shape thoughts are around what we should be doing um, to ad address this. Um, but also, how do we define Australian? Because it's the same problem the Canadians have got where we don't have the language to fall back on as the definition if you're a policy wonk. Um, so. Well, I, 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 the, the definition of that which is Australian is, is obviously um, challenging mm. conceptually in some ways. Um, at its most simple, it is of and from Australia and made by Australians. Um, and that's clearly a very mixed bag of potential outcomes. Ultimately, it comes back to issues of investment mm. and that there is no shortcut. If you want Australia and Australian stories and Australian narratives and Australian imaginations and Australian accents and Australian settings and Australian history to populate the audio and video screens of Australia and elsewhere, you have to invest. Mm. And you have to create an environment that captures investment. Now that can be done by way of incentives that capture private investment or by way of direct investment from government. Yes. Um, clearly, self-evidently as the chair of the ABC, I would say that one of the tools available to government is very direct investment in the ABC. Yes. Now, governments being what, what, what governments are in the modern era and with all the competing forces that attach to them, I think it's incumbent upon the ABC to volunteer very good reasons for doing so mm. and to present really coherent cases as to why that investment needs to happen mm. and what will flow from that investment. And certainly in the instance of the ABC, in relation to anything to do with drama, with the vast majority of documentary, the vast majority of children's programming, um, a lot of the education material, it must be through the independent production sector. Mm. Absolutely fundamental, core, core to the, the policy remit of, of the ABC in the 21st century. I, I think you're one of the first 
people most recently articulating. Um, you were in, I think, the um, Byron Area um, Writers Festival, and you're articulating the role and the value of the independent production sector, which in other territories is more bluntly black and white defined in different ways. But uh, it's the first time I'd seen someone uh, able to express what that was and why it was of merit um, to create, I think, creative creative energy in pockets and bringing that into place. So I don't know if you want to comment more on that, um, but I, I think that understanding is missing from government sometimes. They um, think that maybe because the broadcaster releases the product and it's released under that frame it that doesn't actually come from a set of individual creative businesses and people uh, that are operating if, separately if policy is not designed to celebrate many voices and 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 many sources of 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 creative energy um it's flawed policy in my mm. view mm. and the best and simplest way of doing that is to recognize that we have a substantial independent production Mm. sector now and it is in fact the future mm. and that the pathway must always have as a core imperative that the, the the whole thrust of the policy is to reinforce that sector and ensure it's healthy. I'll come back to that in a minute. One of and the ambitious. Um, we need to be much more ambitious. Well, I, I, I couldn't agree more and I, I think that we need a joint ambition, don't we, from the commissioning piece with the production sector hand in glove to go, this is actually the goal to go forward. Um, and I, uh, I mean, I don't know if you want to comment about the level of ambition <laughs> you want from the ABC, whether it's well, there I, at the I moment. have great, I have very significant, mm. with my colleagues, have very significant ambitions mm. for the ABC. I, I think if the ABC is not commissioning content that is distinctive, and definitionally different and ambitious mm. for Australian audiences and for Australia, it's not doing its job properly. Yes. If, if you're receiving direct investment from government, you better make sure that it, there, there is real purpose behind it and that there's real delivery in giving life to that purpose. Is the tendency, though, in part, for everyone, including the ABC, to fall back on... Um, a, a type of competitive lens looking over your shoulder at what other people are doing and the risk aversion. I think it was Ted Hope that said, um, sort of semi-famously, you don't get fired for saying um, no, you get fired for saying yes if you're a commissioner. So is that driving that the, uh, that the was type a very, of very wise thing that, that Ted said at that time? Hmm. Because the one thing I've observed across a, a very long life in lots of different aspects and of, long of, may it continue. Of, of, of creative life <laughs> yes. is that people only ever track yes. yes. They never track no. Ah. And yet more damage, more harm, mm. more, more really boorish behaviour is seen in no mm. than in yes. Mm. Inherent to yes is the possibility of failure. In no, it never gets tested. No, that's... It never gets examined. And so you see people who move up and up and up and up who are, in fact, have a career built on negativity. Mm. And this is not a healthy thing. Mm. Um, you're, it's reminding me that... that I think but I do think the corollary is that far too much of the process of yes is about the blanding out of creativity yes. and about creating what I would call creative blamange. And this is, this is a really unhealthy trend. And I, I think, at least in the environment of the ABC, the ABC needs to be much more consciously, aggressively ambitious to achieve strong creative outcomes mm. and to back mm. creators and to, and to give them um, voice and empowerment to realise really, really dynamic visions. They're the things that always make people sit, sit up and notice. Absolutely. They're the things that are always the breakthrough moments mm. for, for, for Australia, both with Australian audiences and with the rest of the world. And, of course, what has been interesting about the streaming services is they're backed a lot of really weird, wild stuff mm. that has been the stuff that's cut through with audiences. Mm. 
But the, and the observation there is that they've started to fall back as they've become bigger, more risk averse. Yeah, that's um, true. Following that's maybe true. more patterns of that's true. Um, having and it's that classic case of technology, you know, almost breaking the landscape, creating new ideas, new pathways for audiences, but then folding back to yeah. conservative behaviour. So it, it does absolutely the beacon of the ABC. In some ways, then I, I sort of think that the ABC, sure, it needs to be a very significant and we'll get to how it can continue to be and should be a significant player but it shouldn't be trying in my mind it shouldn't be trying to compete in the same way as a commercial business it it sort of is bigger than all of those things and so I, I, that's my take on it but I'm editorialising but you you know you have, may have a better way to describe it but I, I, I feel the trap sometimes is to start to follow others r rather than be the leader in that way that I think the ABC is renowned. Yes the, the ABC has to has to innovate through having its own pathway and its own personality both in terms of what the objectives are and in terms mm. of the relationship with the independent production sector. Um, I wonder if you would like to just talk a little bit about um, models for financing the ABC because I'm interested in the fact that um, Canada has just done its first stage, although it's it's been it's been law courts, you know, being sued at the moment by the MPA. But it is a measure that's existed for a long time, a five percent um, <coughs> investment that I think the streamers are being asked to contribute now, um, but other businesses have had to do to do with media funds and Indigenous content, and then I think that they haven't yet done their um, Canadian content regulation, but it's a base level of contribution that's being asked of all platforms to a common purpose of which something like, um, or an entity like the ABC could be gaining from. We're relying at the moment on um, the sort of reforms or the media bargaining code that um, the previous um, Morrison government um, did in part that I think the ABC was beneficiary yeah, of. Yeah, but remember but the, B the, the ABC is actually not part of the media not, bargaining right. code, it, it but it did yeah, have right. a separate arrangement okay. that was concluded with several right. of the social media um, platforms. Well, uh, uh, yeah, okay. And, is, is there a path for that type of... Well, I, I, I would think that that's, that's a fairly precarious and sticky wicket mm. for a body like the ABC. I mean, if we are to defend and protect the independence and integrity of the ABC, mm. I think it is a better model for it to actually be a direct recipient of, of public monies and a direct respondent to the parliament in terms of the expenditure of those funds and the, and the delivery against that investment. Is there, I mean, this, you may not want to comment too publicly about it, but is there, a, is there a way that that is not as precarious as it feels every time a government changes, um, that that investment is more baked in um, and that the fragility of the political game um, is not, you know, writ large onto entities like um, the ABC? Because I think we've seen over the years the ABA, now the ACMA, having less independence to sort of do its own thing, like the CRTC might in Canada or Ofcom might. In, it just feels that there's a political overlay into all of these decisions within broadcasting that, in the case of the ABC, affects it. There, there, there's no question that policy has become very much more capital P politics mm. in, in many ways. Um, the current government is committed to securing longer term funding for the national broadcasters. Um, and I think a corollary of that is to have have very definite rules of engagement on the part of the parliament with the with the funding of those institutions and with the reliability of that of that money. Um, in terms of being able to separate the funding of institutions like the ABC from the broad democratic political process, I think that's that's pie in the sky. Okay. I I, I, I don't think it's realistic. Right. Because I think. At least one side of politics will never agree to that. Now, it, that may vary from time to time as to which side of politics it is. Yes, historically that's but, changed, hasn't it? But, yeah. but it, 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 it will be the case. But to put it in context, if you go back to the Hawke-Keating years and cast forward to the present day, the actual decline in real terms, if indexation had applied, mm. and government indexation, of course, mm. is always lower than, than inflation, yes. The ABC would have $494 million more today to invest in Australian content than mm. it has. Mm. It's a pretty dramatic it's figure. It's huge. Uh, we've often done the calculation of the mm. ratio of 
um, population with something like the investment the BBC gets, which is of course exceptional, but it is true of a lot of public broadcasters in Europe. The ratio is way out of whack with um, the investment, I think. So we're, we're um, hand in glove with you there. It, the is BBC is of course on a very, very um, fragile funding basis now because mm. the licence fee itself mm. is under severe attack because of its actually being related to devices that people in many instances don't even have in the, don't even have in their homes yeah I mean and that's part of the question about how do we have the disruptors of <laughs> how do you best manage the disruptors of all of these mediums that affect Australians that land into our, our homes but maybe without any care or responsibility mm. um, how do you have them contribute to an ecology um, and is there better ways than we're thinking about creatively at the moment or you know broadly and part of that is do they have a role to contribute to others but Look, the, the, production the, the landscape aside. of of incentive possibilities and regulatory possibilities mm is is very 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 vast mm. and i think that's that's territory that that i would prefer not to <laughs> not to canvas <laughs> public good headlines though kim but, um the, can i ask then about also the way the abc competes with the independent production section not not in terms of um direct internal offerings but the way it it contracts the way it engages the sort of the behavior of um, the ABC, true of a lot of other businesses, but is there a higher standard that should be expected of the ABC? Look, I, 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 I think there is a tendency in Australia because so much of our industry has has grown from a a support framework mm. from from government intervention that people want everything to be formulaic mm. and they want it all to be reduced to some kind of, if you do A this, you'll get C, that, and yeah. then that will put in there, and then this will be mm. the, the outcome and I get to make the show. Um, I, I don't think that that kind of formulaic approach works any longer. Mm. I think we live in a much more, as I said, fuzzy mm. world. Mm. And so we need to have much greater flexibility. Should, should the ABC always be very attuned to, to advocacy and thinking and vulnerability on the part of the independent sector? Of course it should be. Yeah, okay. Um, should the ABC be responsive to those things? Of course it should be. Should the ABC not be hard and fast and formulaic itself in, in responsiveness to the independent sector? I believe so. Mm. I, I, I think that is, in fact, antithetical to creative thinking. Mm. Uh, and, and maybe the thread that I know you've drawn um, recently as well is that um, you've said a couple of things that I thought were really powerful. One of the is that the audience has flown from the ABC and we, we being the ABC, has to go to the audience. It can't try to lock its content into the ABC and expect mm. everyone to come to it. It needs mm. to follow that, which I think then is, it is a, a great sort of measure and thinking about how and there's complexities about rights and who owns what and all these things in terms of all the creatives, but that needs to be a pathway we're all on the same page about um, to follow that audience or else what are we, what, we are going to lose our audience, are we not? Um, do you want to comment a bit on those? They're, they're very big thoughts in many ways that well, I thought were I, quite I, prophetic. I, 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 I don't think the ABC can be in any way dictatorial about where you may watch or hear something. Mm. You actually have to go where the audience is um, and you have to populate all of the environments in which the audience is actually engaging with content mm. in, in a way that responds to the audience's preference. And, you know, there are many audiences um, where the preferences repose in terms of the way in which they consume a diversity of content. The notion of bringing everything back into a walled, managed garden, mm. in which is curated and 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 offered um, for free to, mm. to to the community as the sole repository of a body of content is just foolhardy, mm. Mm. because people won't do it. Mm. If you're in YouTube. You want the material to be provisioned to you in YouTube. Yes. If if you're if you're in TikTok, you want material in TikTok. Mm. So, the the best the best response to all audience movements is to be 
absolutely engage with the movement and to provide great content. And what's the counter-argument to that That mean, is to, as to why it hasn't already been well, people, top there, of there mind? There is an argument that says that that, that contributes to the general dissipation of um, the ABC as a platform. And I would say, no, that, that has got nothing to do with dissipation. It's got to do with acknowledging the reality of the way in which things are delivered and consumed in the, in the, the, the first quarter of the 20, 21st century, moving into the second quarter of the 21st century. And that process is going to accelerate. Mm, mm. So get over it and get with the message. <laughs> I mean, I feel as if we're all, we're all living Marshall McLuhan for real. Right. You know, the medium is the message. Yes. That the mediums, and there are so many media yes. that, that are delivery agents to, to, to the citizens of Australia. The ABC better ensure that it's familiar with all of them and provisioning its material to them all. And I think that um, what I've observed is there's a sense sometimes of fear that the ABC, if it's not acknowledged or has the, a number count, which I don't think you can now do in any logical way, given, um, but that is its own defence against um, budget cuts and other things that might happen. And I disagree really with that view because I think the influence of the ABC should be everywhere <laughs> and it has that capacity to not have to be trying to close it all down and create ad revenue or things like that. It has that beautiful opportunity to influence all of our lives and it should be everywhere, omnipresent in my mind. Yeah, I, th I think that the, the, the thing that I would say about the ABC in the current era is that the worst thing for the ABC in any environment is to be defensive. It needs to be a constructive contributor to the, the general personality of modern media in Australia. Mm. It needs to be there, ever-present and provisioning great stuff. Mm. And the response to, to the avalanche of negative criticism that's, that in some ways is very predictable from certain sources is to do better work, mm. to work better and do better work. And, I and the, that, 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 that applies in terms of the, the, the internal culture of the ABC and the way it responds to, to creative... The create, to the creative community at large and the way it actually addresses the audience. Mm. Do great work. Well, and I assume that criticism, not even assume, but you, you know that that criticism is about commercial threat usually as a core. Often. often. You know, uh, I mean, yes, there's an ideological threat, but that and often re is... Remember, we have, we have a culture that is very, very unusual in a lot of our commercial media because it's grown up under an absolute protective glove of protection. Mm and coming out from under the eiderdown of protection into a very, very harsh and, and competitive world is something that many of those enterprises are not well practised in. Yes, and then the natural default position of those enterprises is to seek greater protection um, often not. Indeed. And whereas, well, well, they yeah. behave when adver in, in, in certain commercial media um, there's a, a kind of personality characteristic of saying the advertising belongs to us. Yes. And, of course, the advertising belongs to the advertisers mm. and the advertisers will spend the money where they see the best outcomes in terms of what they're trying to achieve in, in promoting their, their goods and services and, and concepts. Um, uh, I think we lived through a period where um, subscription television was the, the standout. You were driving much of that. Um, and one of the things that I, I saw observed perhaps in um, the role I was in was the influence that you had over, um, I think, driving at what at the time was the channel community to, to be bigger, better, drive in local investment. At the time, there was just a, a myriad of Australian investment from that community. The world is very different now, but I, I was conscious at the time of that commercial leadership that was, you know, in your belly wick, but I don't see it quite in that way around Australian production. It seems um, the moment that that scene is, it, look, it's costly. It's, um, there's an overhead that if you're just looking at the, the, the numbers as often people are, it's a, it's a risk and it, it takes a level, level of risk taking in businesses to be able to um, invest heavily in Australian content. I, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but I'm trying to... Uh, th this is where I suppose the, the going back to the incentives and regulation in some combination is the, uh, the, uh, the pathway, I think, to avoid that um, 
it, they're all falling to essentially a couple well, of the Machiavellian. Look, there, there are never any rewards in life um, for poor effort. Mm. And I- I- innovation is the name of the game and investment in in material of relevance to Australians is always going to get mm. better outcomes when you do it really well mm. than alternatives. Yeah. So if you're in the business of provisioning wallpaper, you will have trouble. <laughs> People are not going to respond well mm. to an endless stream of wallpaper. Mm. If you're actually delivering something that is vibrant and animated and energetic and mm. really really reflecting a original imagination, you've got a much better chance of public engagement. Well, and I think that businesses... No, I don't mean that like Pollyanna. No, you know, no, times no. are tough. Yeah. But you, you look at the change in the landscape and in the, in the channel landscape in subscription television, it's really very dramatic. Yes. It's, uh, it's almost unrecognisable, yeah. actually, from that period. Um, I... I I also think one of the challenges, is, because we're in this global landscape, is that if you are running a, a sort of effectively <laughs> the outpost for a global business in Australia, um, there's a sort of a, a what, I don't know, a lack of a set of attention maybe that you're not given, maybe resources you're trying to fight for. And it's often said to me very quietly about the work we do to try to <laughs> uh, do various things to help those people who, of course, can never say that in their own businesses, um, that they want maybe a, a regulatory minimums or some outcomes they're, they're doing because they can't necessarily fight for look, that I, money look, internally. It, uh, I mean, let's be it's very impossible. frank. In, in a market like Australia, mm. I, I doubt that we can achieve all that we have ambition for for, for, for our very talented creative community without mm. a measure of regulation. Mm. Just not possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Regulation and investment, yeah. and there they go hand in hand. And frankly, I, I, I don't see that there is any other no. available alternative, and that's something whether governments like that or don't yeah. like that I think is irrelevant. If they want to see something happen, that's the formula. That's the path. Yeah. The, the, maybe um, I've got two maybe pockets of conversation I want to um, have before we, um, we wrap, but one of them is about... Footloose productions, um, global uh, productions that can land anywhere. Um, reports today about the complete collapse, pretty much in Los Angeles, and as a, a hub um, in terms of the decline. I, I shouldn't say that quite as dramatically as that, but it, it it's very I think much that's just a little yeah. extravagant. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like a bit of hyperbole, but it, it it's the decline of that is is significant um, because uh, of really an absence, I suppose, of California keeping up with incentives. But I think that on the the flip side, I think um, we can easily get into a conversation that there's production activity and uh, that's great. But uh, my sort of take is not all production activity is the same and that there's a difference between a service activity and a originating of IP and Australian story as part of this. And the two things are uh, important because one can sustain the other actually in terms of um, stimulus. I wondered if you wanted to comment about what has changed. It's it's a significant. We were, we're here at, coming from uh, well, what was Fox Studios now Disney Studios. There was a huge difference well, in terms Matt, of when, what's when happened. we when we built this studio back in the late nineteen nineties. There there was no framework for supporting international production at all. Um, the only framework we had was the Australian dollar mm. and the Australian dollar's relative value in terms of production outcomes relative to the US dollar. And at that time, the Australian dollar was a little bit lower than it is mm. today and the maths made sense. Um, and, of course, it, it contributed to a massive burgeoning of infrastructure yes. that was available to the production community yes. in terms of, of all of the kit that was here, and it also led to the development of, of very large post-production digital facilities, which mm. which really did blossom um, during that period in the in in the late nineteen nineties. But there were there were there were no incentives. No, um, well, and, and we invested we we'd invested uh, uh, you know one hundred and thirty million dollars or something mm. in this in this studio facility, and it mm. 
it had um, a pretty dramatic impact. Do you think it's smooth sailing for the expectation that the quantity of that work and the dollar value of that work in Australia is forever <laughs> going to be there? Or uh, what, I, what I observe globally is that really competing, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, um, Europe, um, Canada, there's huge investment and jumps up. Um, I think UK has just jumped up its investment. I, I, I just wonder well, about a how we a certain element play that card. That can become a race to the bottom mm. if, if you're just competing on incentives. Mm. Ultimately, you have to compete on talent. You've got yes. to compete on, on all the technical talent, on all of the, the craft talent, on, on the locations, on, on all of the many many real verities of Australian production and clearly we have the full suite of skills and, and, and people that can really deliver. Yeah. Um, I, I think Australia is firmly on that map now. Mm. Um, I doubt Saudi Arabia is. <laughs> Not yet, although NEOM is trying its hardest to recapture I think, global attention. I think um, for what I hear a lot from the production community is that um, the balance, and I know it's a skill development, it's about certainty in the market for people wanting to work in this industry. A lot of these factors play in it together and um, uh, so any, anything that provides pipelines I always think is uncertainty for people either individually or in business terms is to be applauded. The last thing, um, uh, and hopefully it's uh, not, well, not too controversial, but I think one of the comments you made um, going back to the start at the, the Hector Crawford um, speech was about um, Screen Australia, and it was in the context of um, maybe your earlier comments about saying, no, the agency, um, uh, I think, can gr gr on average, I think Deirdre released a stat, um, uh, which had, has chatted about a stat of about 30% of their of the applications get greenlit, so there's 70% that they can't fund. Um, but it was also, you were commenting at the time, looking at um, whether or not Screen Australia, having, you had various roles in those founding bodies before that, was sort of designed in a certain way that um, hadn't quite maybe fully reached the moment it, at the time, and this was back in 2013, and it was ripe for a, a sort of a, a re-look. And I, I don't know, it's controversial of you to maybe make a statement Look, now, I think, but I, think I just thought, is this time to look at these upon all of us, on all of us mm. to constantly challenge our models, mm. to constantly challenge our, our modes of thinking, um, and to demand of ourselves that we either validate that what we're doing and how we're doing it is the right way to support the intended outcomes in, mm. in, in terms of a body of diverse creative work or whether there are alternatives. Mm. Um, you know, nothing is frozen. No. And, and, in, and in fact, uh, as soon as we freeze anything in this space because of mm. the changes, we're in a lot of trouble. I think it's a nice way to end it, Kim, today. Thank you so much. I think... Um, uh, you challenge me. I think you're challenging the industry. It's great to see you back in the scope of talking publicly about media policy. I know you've been thinking about it maybe and possibly talking more quietly. It is great to have you uh, engaging in this way and we really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. Great pleasure.